So what about you, Jim, ahead of what is a incredibly big week, given all the earnings that are coming? Right? Yeah. Microsoft and Apple, Alphabet, Meta, uh, Amazon, the Fed meeting Tuesday, Wednesday, GDP, uh, a read as well. It's kind of an overwhelming week, Scott, so we better get our sleep this weekend. And I'm not kidding. And I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, 23 hours ago I was with you. We had an extra 15 seconds at the end of the show. You asked me point blank, you know, how do I feel about the markets? I said nervous, okay? And that may catch people by surprise because I've been bullish and I remain bullish in the long and intermediate term. But the truth of the matter is I see the risks that are out there. I see them. You know, bravery is not uh, the absence of fear. It's action in the face of fear. And I see the reasons to be concerned about earnings. But here's Here's what I'm going to say. The week so far and last week as well in earnings, albeit it's only 15 percent of the show so far, it's been pretty good. And one thing that's generally been missing in these earnings reports is kitchen sinking. And there are so many reasons to kitchen sink, whether it's FX, whether it's inflation, whether it's Russia. Now, IBM did kitchen sink it, but that's, you know, that's really the only one I can point to. So the, the problem for making a prognostication in the short term right now is there just isn't enough data. Next Next week really matters. I hear, Steve, the Fed, the Fed is, of course, important. To me, uh, the earnings reports exactly what the supply chain is doing to Apple, to Qualcomm. That's what matters to me. Yeah. What about you, Seach, as you look ahead to, to next week? So I would say this, two things. Number one, don't read too much into this rally. We haven't seen any real change in the liquidity environment. Many names are overbought. They're heading towards their technical resistance levels. The 100-day moving average on the S&P is 4,100. So I don't know if we get to the 4,200. At that point, the markets will be trading in at 18 times PE. That's if you believe the earnings. The last time we were there, the Fed was cutting, not hiking. Number two, I would say be wary of the day-to-day -day market narratives. Um, this this rally was kicked into high gear, starting with last Friday's uh, University of Michigan sentiment sur survey. The bond market is now pricing in rate cuts in 2023, and the timeline for these cuts has been inching forward. The narrative is if the bond market is already pricing in rate cuts, traders believe that they need to be buying risk. We would say not so fast, because I think the Fed we have two more CPI prints before the Fed uh, after this next 75 basis points in July, which takes us to neutral. We have two more. You might see a deceleration in inflation activity, but does the Fed really want to make the mistake that Arthur Burns did in the 1970s and uh, start to start to lower rates um, when nominal GDP started to decelerate? And it ended up exacerbating and prolonging the inflationary episode through the decade into the 80s. I think this Fed does not want to do that. And that's why we are decidedly cautious. And we would be using this bounce to start to think about how to protect portfolios. Are you more concerned, Jim, about the earnings or the Fed and what the Fed says? Um, the earnings. I feel like the Fed's pretty much a known entity at this point in time, right? I mean, they've, they've pretty much told us it's 75 basis points. I don't think they're going to say that they have some secret piece of data that we don't have. I mean, they see what's going on with commodities. They see the labor picture, frankly, probably better than most. So it's earnings where the greatest uncertainty next week lies. Now, that's a short-term outlook from somebody who's known for the long-term outlook. Uh, but it's, it's going to be a hell of a week, Scott. But I mean, there's going to be a lot of information gained. There is. The, I mean, it, these stocks, you know, let's, let's talk about these mega caps. Yes, there are other important names yep. on that board right there, but it, it really sort of rides on just given where the rally's gone, um, how much weight the Nasdaq has brought along in that rally. That's why these stocks now become uber important. Apple's up 20 percent from the June low, right? It's up 15 percent in a month. And a lot of these stocks have had similar uh, outcomes, not quite as robust as that. So as you look ahead to that, um, the risk reward for the biggest stock in the market, says Jonathan Krinsky, Apple looks quite poor to us. That's what he says. He joins us now to tell us why he thinks that. And I can't imagine it's much more, Jonathan, that the fact of what I just said, that the stock ran as far as it did in the period of time in which it did. Is there any more to the story than that? Um, yes and no. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, you know, the basic thesis here, it's had a 20% rally off the lows, almost identical to the move we saw in late March, which, by the way, was right ahead of its... Um, of its last earnings print. Um, and so, you know, the run up into the earnings print always makes you a bit cautious. Um, it's also got the 200 day moving average overhead around 158. So that's another area to uh, to keep in mind. And then we're also seeing some, 
you know, upside exhaustion signals, just different metrics we we focus on, you know, similar readings that we've we've seen Apple stall in the past. So you kind of add that all up. Um, I do think the risk reward is poor here. And the other issue is that it's kind of been treated as a safe haven. You you haven't really seen to this same extent the rally in, in names like Google. Um, and I think as you know, some of the other names have, have shown more downside risk, investors have have moved into Apple and kind of use it as a safe haven. And so I think now um, there is a lot of, uh, I would, you know, I would almost call it a little crowded as a long idea right here.